Hey there, and welcome to another episode of Software Explained Simply. This is episode two. I've done a couple episodes before this, uh, but this is the official second one. And uh, today we're going to be looking at some programming fundamentals. Now, if you're not familiar with this series, it is called Software Explained Simply, and I'm going to do just that. I'm going to explain software concepts, hopefully simply, and give you kind of a big picture and conceptually look at why we do certain things in software um, so you can apply them to your own software journey as you learn how to program. So in this episode, we're covering some generic language fundamentals. You'll find that almost every programming language has these things, or at least these things in some form. And so it's we're, today we're going to look at variables, types, and data structures. And for probably the next two episodes, we'll continue in this fundamentals section. It was a little bigger than I wanted it to be for for one episode, just to keep it um, on the shorter lengthwise, shorter size lengthwise. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So what we're gonna talk about today um, is what I call programming languages in quotes. Uh, we're gonna talk about variables, types, and simple data structures. So first off, when I say programming language, um, I don't really include HTML and CSS in this category. I think you could argue that it is a programming language and there's, I mean, you use it to make software, so it, sure, it's, it's a programming language, but what I mean and what most people mean when they talk about this is a language that is designed to perform logic or instructions. Um, it usually deals with data, so like numbers, text, dates, and it controls the flow and the output of the program. And so I, I don't mean to throw any uh, disses towards HTML or CSS, but I'm just I'm talking about a different classification of languages here. Some examples for these languages would be something like Ruby, C Sharp, JavaScript, Java, or Python. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but just to give you kind of an idea, um, if you didn't know, Java and JavaScript are totally different things. So just good to know. So. When I say programming language, I'm talking about something that primarily deals with storing and retrieving data, um, something that can perform calculations or transformations of the data, and something that allows us to do repetitive tasks easily. Now, as a side note, uh, the examples I'm showing here are in Ruby, but please continue or feel free to use a language of your own. Um, I want to be highlighting the general concepts that kind of transcends a, transcends a specific language and I'll try and point out uh, where differences are maybe between some of the popular ones. But I want you to understand the concept and then you'll find that taking it and applying that concept to your specific language is actually pretty easy. So the first thing we're gonna look at is types. Now most major programming languages have a type system and a type is like it sounds, what kind of thing something is. So we have different types for the data we use. They may be something like a number, um, a decimal, text, and this allows us to know what types of things we can do with that data. So if you have a number, maybe you can perform addition or subtraction on it. If you have a string, you know maybe you can display that. And so most languages generally have these kind of basic types. So you have something for integers and numbers, or sometimes it's called numbers. So for example, 50, you'll have something that can handle floating point numbers. So like 2.15, um, in some languages that's considered a float, in others that's maybe called a decimal. You'll also have something to deal with text, commonly called strings. So John in quotes represents a string. And then you'll have something um, to represent true and false, which we'll look at in much more detail in the next episode, but those are generally called Booleans. And these are special values that allow you to determine which code path your code takes. But again, we'll look at those in more detail later. So one important distinction, if you look at these two examples, they may look very similar, but the first one is the number 125, which would be represented as an integer by most languages. And then the second one is the string 125, which is really the text or the string of characters one, two, and five. So the top one you can perform math on, 
and the bottom one you can't because it's not a number, it is the characters one, two, and five as text. Now I say you can't perform math on it, but some languages are kind of quirky and you can do math on it, but just as a general rule, these are different things. One is a number and one is a string, which is text. So one of the most basic programming language concepts is variables. And variables are useful because you need to be able to store and later reference specific pieces of data and it's helpful to give it a name that is useful for you to remember so if you're working with something you may assign it a value or assign it a name that makes sense when you read the code later code is kind of inherently i mean it's called code right it's not called plain english or plain whatever language like it has a hidden meaning and so by choosing a good variable name it allows us to more quickly read the file and understand what's going on. So here I have three variables. The first one is a variable named X and I'm putting the value of 25 in it. This is also called assignment. So I'm assigning the value of 25 to X or storing the value of 25 in X. Uh, the second one would be a variable called name, which I'm assigning the value John, which is a string because it's wrapped in double quotes. Most languages use double quotes for strings. Some use single, single quotes. Some languages you can use both, like in Ruby, for example. You can use a double or single. And then the third one, I'm assigning the variable is hungry to the value true, which is our Boolean. Now, if we assign a variable, we can later reference that variable to do things with it. So in this example, I've created a variable called x and given it the value 25. And then we can perform basic math operations on this variable because 25 is a number or an integer and you can do basic math. So we can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And then the one at the bottom there is called uh, the modulus operator or X modulo two, which is just the remainder. So if X is 25 and we divide it by two, the remainder would be one because two goes into 25 12 times to give you 24 and there's one left over. And you'll see that come up and, and use in a couple cases throughout your programming journey. Now, one important caveat that some languages have, if you ask for division in Ruby, by default, it does integer division. So six divided by four returns one because four only goes into six one time. If you want the float division, you have to make one of the numbers a float or give it a decimal. So if you want to divide six by four with decimals, you can do six divided by 4.0. 4.0 is a float, and it will give you the answer 1.5. And of course, if you wanna do that with a decimal already, um, it, it automatically does that for you, as in the last example. Okay, so here's a simple uh, assignment problem. You can actually assign variables using other variables, um, which is very handy. So in this example, we set X equal to 25. Then we create a variable called Y and its value is X plus five. And then finally, we create a variable called Z and its value is X plus our variable Y. So what, what do you think the values of X, Y, and Z would be here? And you can pause your video if you would like to. And so let's check ourselves. So X is 25 as we see from the first line. Y is equal to 30, so the value of X, 25 plus five, and then Z is equal to X plus Y, so 25 plus 30 is 55. So hopefully that was uh, intuitive and makes sense for you. We'll um, do one more that's a little more complicated. Now you can reassign a variable value if you want to. So if you start with x equal to 25 and then on the next line of our little program you say x equal 5 then it, it changes the value similarly if you do x is equal to x minus 1 then it would give us 4 because x is 5 5 minus 1 is 4. okay so one more example using our reassignment so x here is 25 we set y equal to x plus 5 and then we set x equal to 1 so what do you expect x and y to be here and you can pause your video again if you'd like okay so x is 25 
next line y equals x plus 5 and then x equal 1. So if you came up with x equal to 1 and y equal to 30, good job. Um, the important part here to note is that when you execute these lines, they happen sequentially. And the value of x, although it changes, does not affect the value of y. The value of y is set on the second line. So when x is changed on the third line, y is not changed. y has already been set on the second one. Now, this is true in most languages for simple numbers. Um, there are cases, which we will get into later, where changing a variable does end up changing another one. But for the case of simple numbers in most languages, once it's set, it doesn't change. Okay, just a quick example to show you kind of the similarities between languages. So at the top, we have a Ruby example, which we've been using. And then the bottom one is variables in JavaScript. And so you can see that they are quite similar. Um, JavaScript requires the var keyword in front of it and a semicolon at the end. And you'll also notice that each language kind of has its own style. So in Ruby, we tend to make variables all lowercase and separate words with underscores, also called snake case. And in JavaScript, we use what's called camel case. So it's under undercase or sorry, lowercase for the first word. Put right up against it is the next one, and it's capitalized. But like what I mentioned earlier about how if you learn one uh, concept is very easy to translate to the next language, uh, this kind of similarities are will happen a lot, and it's it's very easy to move between languages once you get the hang of one of them. Okay, let's change gears a little bit and talk about data structures. Now, data structures are a fancy computer science word for the way that we store data. And they're stored in a way that is optimized for how we're going to use that data. And that will make a lot more sense once we see the examples. But some of the considerations when we're choosing how we want to store data um, would be something like if the data has a specific order, we might want to preserve that or optimize our use for the orderedness of it. Um, if the data has a grouping, so if the data describes a particular thing, we might want to keep all that together. And then how much data there is and then what types of data there are can also affect which structure we might use. So one of the most common data structures you'll see, which is present in almost every language, is the array. And the array is an ordered list of elements, and the orderedness is important here. It's usually represented by two square brackets, open close, and it's useful for accessing elements when you know where it is in the array. So if you want the first element or the third element, you can access that thing specifically. Now, arrays are generally constructed um, between two square brackets. So here we make an array and store it in the variable x, and we store the elements 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now we can store basically anything we want in an array. So if we wanted to store the number one, the Boolean value true, the number three, and then the string four, that's okay, uh, at least in Ruby and most other languages as well. And we can even store arrays of arrays if we want to. So this final line, the first element in our array is the number one. The second element is also an array, which has two elements the string high and the string by, and then the third element is the number three and the fourth element is the string four. And you can nest those indefinitely. So how do we get things out of our array? Uh, we access elements by using the square brackets again. And we do this by asking for the index that the element is at. So give me the first item, give me the last item, give me the second item. Now there's one kind of tricky caveat here. And this is something that is just kind of a basis in computer science as a whole, in that the first item in a collection is at the zero index. So you might think the first item is at index one, but based on somebody a long time ago who decided the first item is at index zero, uh, that's just how it is. So if we want the first element we would access it by using our square brackets and then passing index of zero. 
Um, this is commonly referred to as being zero indexed. If we want the second item, we just go up one and we can see that x of one is two, which is our second element. And then this continues all the way through our array. So the uh, element at index two is the value three and the element at index three is the value four. So we can see that our first element is at zero and our last element is at index three. If this is a little confusing, that's okay. And it is very common even for seasoned programmers to make mistakes when dealing with this zero-based indexing. It's commonly referred to as uh, off by one errors because the value is one off of what you think it should be. It's zero instead of one. So don't worry about that. Most languages actually have adopted, um, or most languages or frameworks have built things on top of this to where you don't ever really have to deal with the particular index because it's such an easy thing to mess up. Okay, now if we look at the length of our array by saying x.length, and uh, we'll, we'll look at more what this is later uh, in much more detail, but we can see that the length is four, which makes sense logically. We look at the array and it has four elements, one, two, three, four. Now, if we think about the length in compared to our indexing, if we asked for the item at index four, in Ruby, you get back nil, uh, null in other language. Basically, there's nothing there or the value is absent. And this is because of our zero-based indexing. So the first element is at index zero. We have a length of four, but the last element is at index three. Okay, so how do we change arrays? Um, well, we just use the basic square bracket operator again. So we looked in the last uh, slide that there is nothing at index four. And so by saying x of four is equal to five, we can add in our next element to our array. Now, there's a couple different ways you can play with arrays. Um, using the indexes is generally not what you'll end up doing. You'll use something else that's uh, kind of has more guardrails so you don't have to deal with the index, uh, zero-based indexing quite as much. But another, ways, another way we can change arrays is by using what's called concatenation, which is just putting the two things together. So in Ruby, you can do x plus, and then the array containing whatever you want. So here I have the array containing the number five, and it just puts our two, <clears throat> excuse me, puts our two arrays together. You can also, uh, in Ruby, call push on the array, which will just push the element on the end. So here we're pushing x, or we're pushing five onto our array x. And then to delete, we can call pop, and that will remove the last element. And again, more on what these uh, dot words are. They're actually methods or functions, and we'll talk more about those later. Okay, so an, a summary for arrays. Arrays are an ordered list of elements. You can access and create arrays by using these square brackets. They're useful for storing data in order or for accessing a particular element. So give me the first item, give me the second item. They are zero indexed, so the first item is at index zero, and the last item is at index length minus one. So in our example, we saw that the length was four, but the last item was at index three. Okay, our next most common data structure is the hash. Um, hashes are used for associating data. They're usually represented by curly braces, and they store data under a specific key with a relationship. So a particular key corresponds to a particular value. In other languages, these are some kind, uh, sometimes called maps, dictionaries, keyword lists. And the way that we store and access data in a hash is very similar to how JavaScript objects work. To give you an example, um, a hash maybe describing a person could look something like this. So we have a hash with two keys in it. The first key is first name, the second key is last name, and these two keys each have associated data with them. So first name is associated with the data John, which is a string, and the keys are also strings. The last name key is associated with the name Smith. So if we take our array that we, or sorry, our hash that we just made, to access data, we can't use the index because the 
hash is not inherently ordered. It doesn't really know uh, in the general case what the item at index zero is. Now some languages will let you do this, but as a general rule, we don't really care about where it is. We care about what data is associated with a particular key. So the way that we can access this is again using the square brackets, but we'll pass the key name that we want. So in this case, the string first name, and that will give us the value we want, which is John. Now, if we want to create a new hash, we can start with an empty one, which is just represented by uh, two curly braces, open, close. And in the same way that we ask for the value, we can set the value or assign it. So we can do x open square brace string first name close equals the string John. And so that puts the string John associated with the key of first name. And if we want to delete that value, we can delete the key, which also gets rid of its associated data um, like this. Again, using a method call, which we will talk much more about uh, in future episodes. So side note uh, for the Rubyists out there, there are two ways to create hashes in Ruby. One is using these, the format that we've been using, which is uh, strings followed by an arrow, associating the key with the value. And that would be considered an old style hash. Uh, Ruby has, not necessarily recently, but there's a new style of hash or newer, which is the one below, which uses something called a symbol, which is basically a fancy string. And so you would see it formatted like that, where it's the name, colon, and then the value. And then when you access, you use the colon as well. So instead of uh, our first example where we had double quote, name, double quote, we just use colon, name. Okay, a summary for hashes. A hash is an associated set of keys and elements. You can access the elements by using the key. And it's useful for natural groupings of data about the same thing. So if you think about describing all the attributes of a person. Now just to kind of compare the two data structures we looked at. Uh, in this example, we have two variables called x. Let's kind of compare how they, how they feel when we use them. So the first one, we have a list of numbers, one, two, three. Now in the second one, we have that same data. We have our one, two, three, but we have it stored as a hash. And instead of being an array, it's in a hash that has keys. So it has first, second, and third. Now, if your goal with this, it's, all, it's always based upon the goal. What are you trying to do with the data? We'll tell you how you should, how you should store it and use it. If we just want an ordered list of numbers, here the order is important. So this fits an array very nicely. Um, we can we know that the elements are ordered, so we can just have one, two, three. Here our hash example, having keys of first, second, and third really don't mean that much when the data is um, one, two, three, it's already ordered. Now, if we contrast that with trying to describe a person, if we had an array with the string John Doe as the first element, and the number 25 as the second, we don't really get the association bit. We might be able to guess that that describes a person, but it's not as clear and it's not as, uh, they would say, semantically correct. The way you're using it isn't as proper. Whereas on the second example, having the name as a key and the age as a key is very useful because we know I'm going to want the name of this person. I'm going to want the age of this person and so I want to be able to, to request those specific fields. So in this bottom example, a hash would make more sense for describing our data. So it really comes down to use case and it'll, it'll be pretty obvious which one you should use when the time comes. And just to kind of combine all those things, you can create um, nested forms of these data structures. So here we have an array called people that contains hashes. So here we have two hashes stored as two elements in our array. And this is something that you'll do um, very frequently and the opposite as well, a hash of arrays. Okay, so homework for this time, a little different from the first episode because I don't know which language you've chosen and that's fine. Um, these, these concepts apply to basically every major language. So what I want you to do this time is to become comfortable with all the things we talked about today. 
in the next couple episodes, we'll be building upon these things and using these data structures and variables. So it will help you a lot if you are comfortable with how to use them and manipulate them when we build on top of that. So in whatever language you've chosen, become comfortable with variables, working with numbers, doing basic math, strings, arrays, and hashes. And then you also might try to do um, some extra stuff like describing yourself using a hash, uh, maybe describe your family using an array of hashes like we looked at a couple seconds ago, and uh, test out what happens when you use variables inside of your arrays and hashes. Okay, that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'll be continuing making these, sticking with the programming fundamental theme. The uh, next one we're gonna look at is how do we do conditional logic and how do we affect the control flow of our program. So I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.